<coughs> Today we are talking about the Crusades, a very important time in history. Obviously the Crusades are uh, a feature of the historic relationship between the Middle East and the West. And so we're going to get into some details about that today. In fact, today, this morning, we're talking about the Crusades. This afternoon, I'll be speaking on history, culture, and conflict in the Middle East. This is the most subjective of my talks. It's the one where I'm giving you more my opinion. And the focus of this afternoon's talk is, why is it so hard for, their to find, for the various parties to find peace in the Middle East? Why have they been trying for almost 70 years to find peace, and yet it continues to be the most unstable region in the world. So, and I'll give you my own views on that. You don't have to agree with them. That's the one that I always get the most reaction one way or the other on. And then tomorrow morning, I'll talk about Alexander the Great and Hellenism, the great conqueror, conquered most of the known world, and um, the influence that he had. For instance, I don't know if it's ever occurred to you, why is the, the New Testament, the Christian Bible, written in Greek when it was written by Jewish people? Well because of Alexander. We'll talk about that tomorrow morning and then tomorrow afternoon as we are approaching Horaeus in Athens. I'll talk about Greece as the birthplace of Western civilization. Most of what we take for granted in terms of the foundational aspects of Western culture come from Greece. Democracy, philosophy, the whole way of thinking, the mindset that we experience in the West as different from, from uh, Asian kind of thinking is because of Greece. And we'll talk about that tomorrow afternoon. So that's what we have coming up. Four more talks. And I will continue to give you this. Uh, when we get back, as soon as we have time, as soon as Carolyn has time, because she does all the work <laughs> in that regard, as soon as she has time to put together the videos, they will be available at this website. You can also search on YouTube, because part of the process of getting them on our website is they, they're, they're posted on YouTube first and then into our website. So um, just let you know that this will be available. I'll keep telling you about it. Um, there's a common opinion about the Crusades, and I'm going to give you a number of quotes that reflect this. David Hume, the great Scottish philosophers, at one time one of my, my real heroes in philosophy, because I started in philosophy before I got into theology. David Hume, in the 18th century, said, The Crusades were the most signal and durable monument to human folly that has yet appeared in any nation or age. The French philosopher, uh, Denis Diderot, in the 18th century also, he was a great Enlightenment philosopher. He was one of the co-authors of the, the Encyclopedia, an attempt to gather all human knowledge. He said the Crusades were a time of deepest darkness and of the greatest folly to drag a significant part of the world into an unhappy little country in order to cut the inhabitants' throats and seize a rocky peak which was not worth one drop of blood. More recently, in 1999, the New York Times uh, said that the Crusades are comparable to Hitler's atrocities or the ethnic cleansing of Kosovo. And former President Bill Clinton in 2011 <clears throat> said, those of us who come from various European li uh, lineages are not blameless regarding the Crusades as a crime against Islam. In 1999, uh, to celebrate or to re uh, recognize, it only was a celebration, to recognize the 900th anniversary of the Crusader conquest of Jerusalem, a group of devout Protestants from Western Europe marched what they called a reconciliation walk from Germany to the Holy Land. And they all wore t-shirts that in Arabic read, I apologize. And their, their statement, official statement reads like this. They said, <coughs> excuse me, I'm talking so long. <laughs> 900 years ago, our forefathers carried the name of Jesus Christ in battle across the Middle East. Fueled by fear, greed, and hatred, the Crusaders lifted the banner of the cross above your people. On the anniversary of the First Crusade, we wish to retrace the footsteps of the Crusaders to apologize for their deeds. We deeply regret the atrocities committed in the name of Christ by our predecessors. We renounce greed, hatred, and fear and condemn all violence in the name of Jesus Christ. In other words, to sum up, the popular wisdom about the Crusades, it's generally thought that the Crusades were all about an expansionistic, imperialistic Christianity that was uh, intent on brutalizing, looting, and colonizing a very tolerant and peaceful Islam. A lot of people today think of the Crusaders as having marched east in pursuit of lands and loot, that they were prompted by power-mad popes, that they were intent on forcing Muslim people to become Christians, and that the Knights of Europe were barbarians, sort of like drunken frat boys, who went to the Middle East to brutalize everyone in their path and to uh, oppress an enlightened Muslim culture. There's only one problem. That's not true. 
the common perception, and more and more historians today are coming along and saying that simply doesn't line up with the facts. There were terrible things done during the Crusades on both sides, but the motivations that most people think led to the Crusades simply are not accurate, and the there is no clear good guy and bad guy in this. So we're going to talk about it. When we talk about the Crusades, what actually are we talking about? Here's a definition for you. In the 11th century AD, Islamic forces of the Muslim Seljuk Turks defeated armies of the Christian Byzantine Empire, cut off Christian access to holy sites in and around Jerusalem, and threatened to overrun all of Asia Minor, that is what we know of as Turkey today, and also through the Iberian Peninsula, Spain and Portugal, to uh, enter into Western Europe. In response to this, and in, in response to pleas for help from the Eastern Emperor in Constantinople, Christian Western Europe launched almost two centuries of military campaigns to free the Holy Land from Muslim control. That's what the Crusades were. Historically, this period of time was very important, but I don't think, I, I don't know of any other period in history that is as broadly misunderstood as the Crusades. They evoke very strong feelings, very strong reactions. When George W. Bush, after 9-11, when he announced that the, the United States was going to respond vigorously, he said we are going to have a crusade against terrorism. The very fact that he used the word crusade created an international furor because it suggested, you know, the negative feelings people had about that. The word crusade comes from a French word which means to take up the cross. And in fact, during the time of the Crusades, people would refer to their commitment to take up the cross, meaning to go on crusade. Today, the word crusade can be either positive or negative. You know, somebody has a, a, a crusade to, you know, get their kids to clean up their room. Or it can be something that is, um, so it can be positive. I assume that's positive unless you're the kids. Or and, and it, can, it can suggest self-sacrifice and uh, devotion to a cause. Or it can be misguided and malicious action, either one. The Crusades were a holy war in the sense that they were fought on behalf of a faith, Christianity, but there were a lot of other reasons. And it is way too simple to assume that it was just an act or an eruption of religious prejudice. So let's talk about that. I think the simplest way to understand the motivation behind the Crusades, the initial motivation, is to look at some maps. I've showed you this map before. It's a very important map. This is the state of Christianity in 565, in the middle of the 6th century AD. All of the yellow areas and the green areas reflect the growth of Christianity. The broad green line is where the Byzantine Empire existed then. So Christianity had spread well outside the Roman Empire, uh, the Byzantine Roman Empire, up into uh, the Franks, the Visigoths, all of these groups that had previously been barbarians that had you know, uh, sacked Rome, for instance, they had all become Christians. They had not been forced to become Christians. This had been something they had chosen to do. Christianity, not until the 800s under Charlemagne in Western Europe, was there uh, concerted efforts to try to force people to convert to Christianity. Charlemagne did some of that, and there have been some others. But by this time, Christianity had spread because people believed it. They liked it. They thought it was the right thing. Then, in the middle of, or early of the 7th century, 622, is marks the date of the beginning of Islam. That is when the Hajira, the pilgrimage from Mecca to Medina occurred, and that's where that's where the calendar for Islam starts. So between 622 and 750, Islam starts, it's born, it, it grows rapidly, it engulfs Christian areas of North Africa, Middle East, and even the Iberian Peninsula, Spain and Portugal. I've showed you this map as well. Uh, the dark orange area is the area that became Islamic under Muhammad's time. The Orange areas are the areas that became Islamic under the Rashidun Caliphs, the first four. And then, under the Umayyad dynasty, the next one, they went all the way up into uh, the Iberian Peninsula and all the way up near, you know, two-thirds of the way to Paris. It was only Charles Martel, the grandfather of Charlemagne, who fought back the Islamic armies at Tours and Toulouse. At this time, they had gone over into Afghanistan, Pakistan, um, and were beginning to infringe on Anatolia, modern-day Turkey. They had not yet gotten into Eastern Europe. But this is what it looked like. Now, this is, at the greatest extent, the Arab Islamic Empire, almost all of the Iberian Peninsula. At this point, these orange areas were all that was left of the Christian Byzantine Empire, and they were beginning to infringe there. I want to show you 
these two maps together. This is Christianity in the mid sixth century. This is Islam between the mid eighth century and the mid ninth century. Do you see why there was concern? All of the lands that traditionally had been the strongholds of Christianity that had voluntarily become Christian, all of these areas, with the exception of Western Europe, had become Islamic. And they had been become Islamic. Initially, the people were conquered by Islamic armies. The governments were conquered. Muslims, the Muslim people did not force conversion. That's a common misunderstanding. The Muslim leaders, the caliphs, did not force people to become Muslims until the 11th century. The Mad Caliph al-Hakim did, did that, and I'll talk about him in a minute. But you can see why there was concern in Christian Europe, because the Iberian Peninsula, all of these areas of the, the Middle East, uh, Egypt, North Africa. North Africa was one of the greatest strongholds of Christianity. Uh, Saint Augustine was Bishop of Hippo, which is in what we know of as Libya. So North Africa was an enormously important part of the Christian, of the Christian world. Islam had conquered most of that by the middle of the ninth century. And I think these two maps give you a very strong reason of understanding what the motivation was for Christian Western Europe to try to do something about this. Okay. In 1009, I just mentioned his name, the Fatimid Caliph al-Hakim, who was known as the Mad Caliph of Egypt, he was part of the Fatimid dynasty that controlled Egypt, the only time there's ever been a Shia dynasty in, in, that had a major control, other than Ali, the fourth of the Rashidun Caliphs himself. But anyway, um, they were in Egypt, and al-Hakim called for destruction of the Christian shrines in the Holy Land, and he began to attack Christian pilgrims. They destroyed the Church of the Holy Sepulchre. It was later rebuilt in 1048. Well, the rest of the Islamic world did not approve of this either. And so the rest of the Islamic world lined up against al-Hakim, and they gave the Byzantine Christians the right to protect. They actually encouraged the Byzantines to uh, provide a protectorate over the Christian signs in the Holy Land. And it was in 1048, after the Byzantines sort of took over protection of this area, with the support of the rest of Islam, that they rebuilt the Church of the Holy Sepulchre. Then in 1040, the Seljuk Turks, the, the Turks had come out of Turkmenistan, that's why they're called Turks, and had been uh, mercenaries for hire uh, by Muslim Persia. And finally, they realized, you know, we're doing all the fighting, we've got all the strength, why are we listening to this guy? So they overthrew the... Uh, Muslim Persian Sultan in 1040 and then in 1054 there's a great schism where Eastern Orthodoxy which is uh, Eastern Greek Church of Christianity and the Western Latin Catholic Church splits in two now this is what the church the Christian Church looked like in 1054 after what's called the Great Schism um, the center of Western Latin speaking Christianity was in Rome, and the head of that church was, as it is today, the Pope of Rome. In the East, they spoke Greek, not Latin. They had a different rite or, or order of service. They, there were some other differences between the two. Um, one side believed that the communion should be offered in leavened bread, the other side unleavened bread, and that was a big deal. The uh, priests in the Eastern or the Orthodox side were allowed to marry, in fact, encouraged to marry. On the Roman Catholic side in, West, in Europe, they were not allowed to marry. The biggest concern, and the thing that sort of broke the camel's back at the end, was <clears throat> that the Nicene Creed, if you've ever been associated with churches anywhere, you probably are aware of the Nicene Creed. It had been written at the first great church council in the 320s at Nicaea, which is near Constantinople. It was written in Greek. Well, um, the Western... Christianity, Latin Christianity, he had taken and translated it, but at some point they added a phrase to it. Previously, that the Nicene Creed had said, "We believe in the uh, we believe in the Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit," and it said that the Holy Spirit proceeds from the Father. Well, in the West, they added a phrase that proceeds from the Father and the Son. That and the Son is filioque. That phrase offended the Greeks, they disagreed with it theologically, and that was like the last straw. The, there was always a conflict between, is the Pope in Rome the head of the Christian faith, or is the Patriarch in Constantinople the head of the Christian faith? Now, at one time, there had been five great patriarchies, five centers of Christianity. 
they have been Alexandria in Egypt, Antioch, which is um, Syria, northern Syria, um, western, eastern Turkey, uh, the Constantinople, Jerusalem, and Rome. Well, what had happened to Alexandria, Antioch, and Jerusalem? They were now under Islamic control. There were only two great patriarchies or centers of Christianity left. And so the heads of those two areas, the patriarch, as he was called in Constantinople, and the Pope in Rome, were always in conflict about who's really in charge here. Well, eventually, they got so many conflicts, so many differences, different rights, different languages, different everything, that in 1054, the Pope in Rome sent representatives to Constantinople, and, and some pretty gruff representatives, and they sort of argued about things for a while, and then in the middle of a service in the Hagia Sophia, the cardinal, the bishop that had been sent by the Pope in Rome as his representative, walks up and slaps orders of excommunication for the patriarch and the emperor, because it was an emperor in Constantinople, they're excommunicated. Well, immediately the patriarch of Constantinople excommunicates the Pope in Rome. <laughs> so everybody's excommunicating everybody, and there was this great split. For a long time after this, there was a desire and an effort to reunite the two halves of Christianity. It's interesting that only in our lifetimes has the patriarch of Constantinople and the Pope in Rome started really communicating with each other. The rift was so severe that it's been a thousand years uh, almost before they were really willing to talk. So, with the Great Schism splitting Eastern and Western Christianity, we then have the Seljuks, after having taken over the Muslim Empire in Persia, they continue to move to the West, and in 1095, or I'm sorry, 1071, they defeat the Byzantine army, the Christian Byzantine army, at Manzikert, and they begin to occupy the whole of the um, Anatolian region, what we know of as modern Turkey. Then, it got so bad, they were right up against the gates of Constantinople, which was heavily fortified, and they were trying to break into Constantinople. And then, in 1095, the Byzantine emperor in Constantinople sends a pleading message back to Western Europe, to the most powerful person in Western Europe at that time, who was Pope Urban II, much more powerful than any political leaders. And they sent a plea and said, help! The Muslim armies are right outside the gates of Constantinople. We, we need help, or we're going to be overwhelmed. We're going to be overrun. That motivation, the political motivation, and, and along with that, the Patriarch of Constantinople and the Emperor of Constantinople said, if you will come and help us, we'll become Catholics. We'll acknowledge the authority of Rome. We'll, you know, whatever you want, just come and help us. The, the Muslim Seljuk Empire, as I mentioned, this is in 1092. This is when, right before the plea goes out from the Byzantines to Western Europe, they had defeated the uh, Muslim armies that were in control of this region in 1040, here at the Battle of Dandanakan. The capital was in Baghdad. They took over Baghdad. And at Manzikert in 1071, they defeated the Byzantine army, and they continued to move over. This is Constantinople. By 1092, they were literally right outside the gates of Constantinople. And in 1095, that's why the emperor in Constantinople sent a request for help. That gives you sort of the history, where we are before the crusade, right up to where the crusades start. And I want to now give you the reasons for the crusades. Again, this is the part that most people get wrong, because a lot of people who are published and whatnot get it wrong. And by the way, this isn't just my idea. As I say, a lot of historians are beginning to recognize this now. First, the Crusades happened as a response to the Byzantine Emperor's request for help against the Seljuk Turks who were right outside the gates of Constantinople. And remember, Western Europe already had seen Muslim armies come up through the Iberian Peninsula in Spain and threaten Western Europe. Now they saw them because once they, once they defeated Constantinople, then they'd be entering into Eastern Europe. So there was this concern. It was to defend Christian Europe against further Muslim invasion, which they had been seeing for 500 years by now. The hopes of reuniting the two halves of Christendom, which nobody had really been pleased with the fact that they had split in two. They, you know, the leaders of the church thought, we've got to figure out some way to try to make this right, but nobody was willing to give. There was a desire to establish the authority of Pope Urban. This is one of the reasons Pope Urban was willing to respond is because the the people in Constantinople said, if you'll come and help us, then we will agree that you are the head of the church, and we'll, we'll be obedient to Rome. And so Pope Urban II saw this as an opportunity to establish not only unity, but himself as the leader. And 
some of that may have been political intention. Some of it may simply have been because he thought that was the right thing to do. We can't assume negative uh, motivations here. And they did it in defense of Christian holy sites and pilgrims. The Turks had cut off uh, access to the holy sites in, 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 in Jerusalem and in the Holy Land. And pilgrimage was an important part of people's expression of their faith. They did it to focus the energies of Western Knights away from internal fighting. How many of you all have ever been military? Okay. Have you ever done something like paint all the rocks around the parking lot white, and then when you're done, go back and paint them again? Have you done that? Why does the military do things like that? Because historically, one of the biggest problems that you have if you have an army is what are you going to do with the army when they don't have a battle to fight? You train, you train them to fight, now they don't have anybody to fight, what are you going to do with them? Well, that was a problem in Western Europe. The knights, the, the knightly class, had been trained in the martial arts, that is, the, the, to fight. Well, when they didn't have an enemy to fight, they fought each other. And sometimes they fought anybody else that came along. In fact, the Catholic Church, in order to try to put a lid on that, they had passed two ordinances called the Peace of, of um, I'm sorry, the, the Peace of God and the Truce of God. The peace of God said, here's the list of people you can't beat up on. <laughs> Women, poor people, peasants, children, you know, etc. And so, and they said, under penalty of excommunication. So there was a spiritual consequence if you did that. That was the peace of God. Then they established what they called the truce of God, which said, here are the days that you can't fight. You can't fight on Sundays, you can't fight during feast days or holy days, etc. So the church was making active efforts to try to keep these knights who were looking for somebody to fight from fighting each other or other people. Well, here was an opportunity where they thought this is a legitimate cause. They, the, the emperor and the patriarch of Constantinople are saying, send somebody to help fight these Turks who were threatening to take Constantinople. And they thought, well, this is a great use for these guys. And then there was a belief in the imminent second coming of Christ. There had been a strong belief before the year 1000 that Jesus Christ would return at the turn of the millennium. And he hadn't. We're about 100 years later. And they kept thinking, well, maybe, maybe today, maybe Tuesday, maybe by Friday. But they had developed this idea about, well, he hasn't come back yet. Why is that? They thought that it may be because Jerusalem and the Holy Land needed to be in Christian hands before Jesus would come back. And so this was a motivation. They also believed, most unfortunately, that all Jews needed to convert to Christianity before Jesus came back. <clears throat> and if they didn't convert, then better they be dead. It sounds really awful to us, but this was, this was actually an element of what they believed their faith said. It wasn't just, oh good, I get to hurt people. It was not that at all. Um, <laughs> And it was during this time, too, recognizing there were spiritual motivations to a lot of this, and we'll talk about. Um, this was the time in which the Pope, in order to encourage knights to come on crusade, to take up the cross, <clears throat> that they came up with what's called a plenary indulgence, which basically means plenary indulgence is whatever you've done, doesn't matter. You don't have to spend time in purgatory, which is the Catholic belief at that time. And if you fight for the cause of Christ in the crusades, then you're guaranteed salvation and you're forgiven of all the sins that you do, no matter what it is. Well, that was a pretty big offer. And a lot of people liked that and were willing to sign up for it. In fact, way more than the Pope expected. Wait, did I miss one? Oh, yes. Very, very few of the knights who participated in the Crusades went there for adventure or gain. In fact, they now have records that many of the knights who left Western Europe to fight in the Crusades or to go on crusade, they mortgaged everything they had to pay for this. They sold their lands, they put their lands in debt, they, um, many of them did not believe they would come back. They thought they were going there and that they would die. And so they made arrangements to care for their family and other than that, it cost a lot of money to do this. To travel all the way across Europe, to have horses and servants and food and all of the supplies necessary, to make arrangements you know, in advance all the way along there to be able to get there cost a fortune. Many of them sold everything they had. They didn't go there to make money. They, they impoverished themselves in order to participate. We have a lot of records now of people who did that. So very, very few of them would, would have been motivated by an uh, effort to gain land or to gain money or loot 
or for the adventure of it. It was an act of faith for most of these people. Misguided in some ways, for sure, but still. So, the major crusades. There were four major crusades and four minor crusades to the Middle East. I'm going to go through those briefly for you, and then there were some other additional minor crusades that were not to the Holy Land. They were within Europe. They thought, okay, we got this crusader thing going, let's fix some of the problems we have around here. In November of 1095, the Byzantine Emperor pleads for help from Urban II. Urban II, who was the Pope at that time, they were actually meeting at a church council, Council of Clermont. Councils in those days would often last for years. I mean, and people would come and go, etc. But they were at the Council of Clermont. Pope Urban gets this request, and for the reasons I just mentioned to you, he agrees that the, the Western Catholic Christian should respond, and so he calls for people to fight this holy war. And he very famously apparently said, Deus vult, in Latin means God wills it. The suggestion, and he established that the departure date would be August of the next year, August 15th of 19, or, uh, 1096. The Pope had no, goal, no idea that the goal was to conquer the Holy Land. That was not the expectation that the Pope had. He did not set that as an expectation, nor did the Emperor in Constantinople. The only goals were to protect Christian pilgrims, and especially to protect Constantinople as the barrier uh, in Eastern Europe from the Muslim armies. Um, it's also the case that the Pope had no idea how many people were going to show up. There are indications from writings from that time. He expected a few thousand. Well, the first campaign, first crusade, there were a hundred thousand. There was no idea people were going to show up like that. What happened was, when the Pope said this at the Council of Clermont, which means he had priests and monks and church leaders uh, from all over had gathered, a number of the priests and monks took it very seriously, and they went out and started preaching the crusade and telling people, you have to do this, you have to go. And there ended up being 100,000 people on the first, the first formal crusade, the first true crusade. But before we get to that, now remember that August of 1096 was when they were supposed to leave on the First Crusade. In April of 1096, well in advance, we have what was called the People's Crusade or the Peasant Crusade, to everyone's chagrin except the people who were on it. What happened was, with all of this local preaching of these um, monks and priests, etc., they generated so much enthusiasm that 40,000 non-military, these, these were not fighters, they were farmers and merchants, they get together and they decide, under the leadership of a fellow named uh, uh, Peter the Hermit of Amiens in France, that they were going to go, just go on. And everybody's saying, whoa, whoa, wait, 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 don't go. <laughs> they believed that it was a call from God, they were going to do it. They traveled through Europe, and remember that they believed that the Jewish people had to either convert to Christianity or not be alive in order for Jesus to come back. And, on, and one, of, one of the horrors, again, this was not an official part of the, the Crusades, they did persecute Jews all through Europe as they traveled through <laughs> because they were doing some horrible things, sacking small towns, uh, etc. None of this was officially uh, approved of. In fact, they, the, the Pope and everybody else was trying to stop all this. They are approaching the Hungary, which controlled most, almost all of Eastern Europe at that time, and the King of Hungary had heard they were coming and what the stuff they were doing, and so he tried to stop them, and many of them were killed by the army of the King of Hungary. And it, rather than let them just march through. Quite a few of them did get through. They got to Constantinople, and the emperor in Constantinople said, what am I supposed to do with you lot? You're not knights. You're not soldiers. You're not going to help me. And he didn't know what to do with them, and he didn't want to have to keep feeding them, so he said, I'll tell you what, I'll let you have some boats to get across the Bosporus. They got on the other side. They started marching through Anatolia. They got to Nicaea, and the Muslim armies massacred all of them because they weren't even warriors, they were not knights. Um, so this was a horrendous start to this thing, and that's the sort of thing that happened that has given all of it a bad name, but that was not an official crusade. That was just a, a, an eruption of passion over this thing. The first, technically, the first crusade began a little bit later than the Pope had asked for, December of 1096. The first true crusade was mostly uh, French, and a few Italians. In fact, the French, since they were dominant in the First Crusade, all of the Muslim peoples from that time, all of the, all the people in the Middle East, they referred to all of the Crusaders as Franks. 
They were the Frankish army, even though some of them were German, some of them were English, some of them were, were Italians. So the Franks got about 100,000 people. The, the vast majority of that 100,000 were not knights. They were not fighters. They would have been servants, retainers, people to take care of the horses, all of that kind of stuff. But 100,000 people traveled east. They got to Constantinople, and the emperor in Constantinople said, great, now I've got some people who can fight. And he gave them provisions on the agreement that they would, any lands they conquered that had been part of the Byzantine Empire, they'd give them back to him and that they pledged their, their loyalty to the emperor in Constantinople as long as they were in the east. So they, they cross over, they win battles across Anatolia, they uh, get to Antioch, they conquer, they besiege Antioch and take Antioch, one of the major cities, remember that was one of the five major patriarchal cities. They go south to Jerusalem, and they conquer Jerusalem in July of 1099, and they set up four crusader states, they were called. At this time in Western Europe, they referred to this region as the Outremer, the land beyond the sea. They created four Outremer um, principalities, if you will, of the Crusaders. This is the route that they took, some from up in Germany, some from Italy, some from um, France. They all converged on Constantinople through Asia Minor, um, and then ended up taking Antioch, and then later, 1099, Jerusalem. They created four crusader states, the county of Edessa, the principality of Antioch, the county of Tripoli, and the kingdom of Jerusalem, each with their own rulers. The other things here, you'll notice the Fatima Caliphate, the green down here. The purple is the part that they had conquered and they gave back to the emperor of Constantinople. So they had re-extended, to some extent, the, um, the Byzantine Empire. And then you had a principality of Armenia and Silesia uh, up here that didn't really play in it. You won't hear that referred to much. That had already existed. Um, and it was not Muslim, so they didn't have a problem with that. So these four creator states, the Outremer, the land beyond the sea, are set up. After this first crusade, every other crusade was launched primarily in response to some defeat that the crusader states experienced. The second crusade was launched in 1147, and it was launched because the Muslims Muslim armies had defeated and conquered the Crusader County of Edessa, one of the four principalities or states, in 1144. So the Second Crusade, mostly French and South German, they um, get together, they march east. So the Crusader states have existed for almost 50 years at this point. They get to the east, and it's like they didn't quite know what they were going to do. Once again, that they, they pledged to the Byzantine Empire that they would give his lo their loyalty, they would give him back any land, but they they couldn't agree on stuff. The leadership was not unified. They didn't know what to do. They get to the to the Holy Land. They go, well, what do we do now? And somebody came up with a really ridiculous idea. Well, why don't we march over and besiege Damascus? Damascus had nothing to do with anything. They didn't. It didn't. wasn't a center. It wasn't something that would gain the, the military advantage. So they march over to Damascus. They besiege um, Damascus for five days, and then they get bored, and so they all go home. That was the Second Crusade. Nothing happened. This map, which I'll show you a couple of times, shows the various routes. Uh, the red line is the First Crusade, the one that conquered these areas and set up the four states, the Crusader states. The green is the Second Crusade, very similar kind of route, but they just sort of petered out when they got bored. Um, I'll come back to this for the third and fourth. The Third Crusade began in 1189, and it sometimes has been called the Crusade of the Three Kings. And it's the one that most people, if they have any knowledge of the Crusades, Crusades at all, this is the one they'll be aware of, because there were three kings that pledged to march in this crusade. Uh, king Henry II of, of England had promised to go on crusade, and then he died. So his son, Richard I, who became known as Richard the Lionheart, you've probably heard of, you've seen the Robin Hood movies, this is in that time period. Richard the Lionheart from England, Philip of France, Philip II of France, and the Emperor Frederick Barbarossa of Germany, they all agree they're going to go on crusade. Well, uh, th the problem is that from England, Richard decides to go by sea. Philip is sort of delaying and delaying, so Frederick Barbarossa decides to go on. He takes his army, and he proceeds across, gets approval from uh, the, the Emperor of Constantinople. When they get into Anatolia, Asia Minor, he drowns trying to cross a river. Well, once he drowns, most of his knights 
don't have any interest in this anymore, so they turn around and go back home. Some of them proceed on. There's still some German soldiers that go on, uh, knights that go on. Richard and Philip finally hook up. They proceed to the Middle East, and uh, they conquer the city of Acre, or Acre, which was a great fortress city. Once they conquer Acre, Philip says, okay, that's all I need to do. I conquered one of the major cities here, and so he went home. That left Richard the Lionheart there as the leader of all of the forces of the Crusaders. Um, about this time, actually after the Second Crusade, the Muslim armies had a new leader. His name was Saladin. Saladin was Kurdish. He was not Arab. He was Kurdish. He actually had been the vizier, the sort of primary council uh, of the Fatimid Caliphate in Egypt. Well, they got corrupt and weak, and when the Sultan died, Fat uh, he took over and created the Ayyubid dynasty. He did not declare himself to be the caliphate, the caliph, the religious leader, but he had created the uh, Ayyubid dynasty. So he was the leader. He was a great military leader. And the, these wonderful stories about Saladin and Richard the Lionheart developed real respect for each other. They fought terrific battles, but there were, they were committed not to do atrocities. In fact, there's a story that at one point Richard, and this is back when kings fought. They actually were in the front lines. Um, Richard is fighting, and he gets dehorsed. De he's off of his horse, and he's fighting on foot. Well, Saladin sees this, and he sends him a horse because he said a king should not have to fight on foot. They developed a real respect for each other, and in fact, they ended up in 1192 signing a treaty. And the treaty said that the Crusaders would not try to conquer anymore. They could stay where they were at that time. But uh, they would not try to take back Jerusalem, which they had not been successful doing because of supply problems but that uh, Saladin would guarantee that Christian pilgrims could come and visit the Holy Land without being bothered, and that they would not seek to conquer any more of the Byzantine Empire. They sort of had a truce and settled on what was okay with them. So this is um, the path that, the blue path is where Richard the Lionheart went. He connected with some of the people, Philip of France in Sicily, and then they went on together. Um, Along the way, he actually freed several cities from Muslim control as he came around and sailed around the Iberian Peninsula. So he was working all along the way. After the Third Crusade, in 1198, Pope Innocent III is elected, and he calls for a new crusade. You know, they've, they've gotten their blood up about this. So a new crusade, the Fourth Crusade, is called in 1202. At this point, they've decided it's better to go by sea than by land, because then we don't have to fight the king of Hungary. Hungary, we don't have to, we don't even have to necessarily deal with the emperor in Constantinople. So they say the sea-going power in Western Europe at that time was Venice. Venice was an independent city-state. So they negotiate with the Doge, or the leader of Venice, whose name was Enrico Dandolo, that he should build ships for them so that they can have their own ships and go to the Holy Land in these ships. Well, the Doge agrees. They say, we will have 30,000 crusaders, 4,500 knights, and all of the retainers, and horses, and we want to leave on June of uh, 1202. So the Doge had two years to build his ships. He does, he builds the ships, but when 1202 comes around, instead of 30,000 crusaders, they only have 11,000 crusaders, and they don't have enough money to pay for the boats that they ordered. Well, the Doge says, I'm not just going to give them to you. So, but he wise, but unscrupulous kind of guy. He says, but you can do something for me. Until a few years ago, we controlled a city in Croatia called Zadar, a very wealthy trading post. It had been taken away from them, and they said, we want it back. You've got soldiers and horses. We've got boats. If we take you to Zadar and you take the city back for us, we'll take you on to the Holy Land. And the Crusaders, actually the Pope heard about this, and he sent word to the leader of the crusading party if you do that, you're excommunicated. But the guy really wanted to go so much, he didn't bother to tell any of the rest of the party. So they all get in the boats. They go to Zadar. They conquer the city of Zadar. They give it to Venice. They then leave Zadar, and they go to Constantinople. They decide to go there first. Along the way, they had met up with this guy named Alexius the Younger. He was his father, uh, whose name was Isaac II Angelus. Isaac II Angelus had been the emperor in Constantinople. He had been overthrown in a coup and blinded, his eyes were put out, and he was put in prison. Well, his son, Alexius the Younger, meets up with these crusaders on the Venetian boats and say, if you will go with me to Constantinople, free my father and put him back on his rightful throne, 
then we, I will give you 200,000 silver marks, which was the money of the time. I will provide you with all the provisions and 10,000 more soldiers to fight with you in the Holy Land. They went, cool, we'll do that. They get to Constantinople, they besiege Constantinople, they win the victory, they free Isaac II of Angelus, put him back on his throne, and then find out they have no money. That Angelus, uh, Isaac II of Angelus and his son, Alexius the Younger, can't pay them what they had promised. So the Crusaders do what any sensible person would do. They sack the whole city of Constantinople. And they set up in Constantinople their own Latin. Remember, this was Greek. This was a, this was a, a different emperor, a different ruler, a different religious order. They sacked Constantinople and they set up a Latin kingdom, a Western European kingdom in Constantinople that lasted for 56 years. And because they sacked Constantinople, these Western knights, that finalized the rift between East and West, between Orthodox, Greek, Eastern Christianity, and Latin-speaking Roman Catholic Western Christianity. And that's why it has taken them 800 years before they'll even seriously talk to each other. That was the last straw in that relationship. So this, starting in Venice, stopping off in Zadar, Croatia, and then coming around to Constantinople, they, they never got any further than Constantinople. They, they sacked the city, took it over, set up a Latin kingdom there, and never went any further than that. That was the Fourth Crusade. Those are the four major crusades. The only one that really conquered anything was the first one. And then everything after that was an attempt to sort of either uh, address or respond to some other defeat or to um, to try to do something more and not succeed. So this is a different map that shows you all the different locations that they came from in the, in the four crusades which lasted from 1095 to 1204. Okay, now, there were, in addition to that, four additional crusades to the Middle East. Um, crusades 5, 6, 7, and 8, and none of them achieved anything for the West. Nothing. In fact, the only notable event probably from any of them is in 1270, King Louis IX of France, he was sainted. This was Saint Louis. If you ever been to Saint Louis? Named after him. You ever been to San Luis Potosi in Mexico? Uh -huh. Named after him. He was a, he's a saint of the Catholic Church. He was apparently was a very great a great guy. But he gets there and he's doing this as an act of devotion. This, but he gets to North Africa because they decided at one point if we can conquer Egypt, um, and take Cairo, that will be a, or Alexandria, that will be a center for us to then conquer the rest. And so he goes in, but he, uh, they have a plague, the army is decimated, Saint Louis dies in North Africa. 1289, the Crusader County of Tripoli falls. Remember, Jerusalem had already fallen. And in 1291, Acre falls, it is, and the last of the Crusaders are driven out of the Middle East. That is the end of the Holy Land Crusades. Later on, there are minor crusades. I mentioned the Peasants Crusade already. It's not one of the formal crusades. There also were Northern European Crusades against pagans in Germany and Northern Europe. And one of the, I'm gonna talk about the martial orders in a minute, the, the Knights Templar and some others, because they're fascinating. Some of them, the, the Teutonic Knights, participated in the Northern Crusades. We then have the Albigensian Crusades against a group called the Albigensians or the Cathars. They were considered heretics in Western Europe and they launched crusades in France and Bosnia against them. Again, these have nothing to do with the Middle East. Um, there then was the Children's Crusade, a horrific thing where a young man said he had visions from God that children would gain victory. This is in the early 1200s. He got thousands of children to go with him, believing that God was leading them, and he said, we're going to get to the coast, we're gonna march through, and when we get to the coast, there will be boats available and they will take us there. Well, they got to the coast, there were no boat, boats available, but they were all taken captive and sold into slavery. Um, not a very pleasant thing. And then the 10th Crusade, which is called the Reconquista, was the retaking of the rest of Spain from the Muslims. The Muslims had continued to control the southern part of Spain, and so in the 1200s through the 1400s, in fact, 1492, the year that Columbus discovered America, he didn't discover it, somebody was already here, but he discovered it for Western Europe. Um, that's when they finally drove the last of the Muslims out of uh, the Iberian Peninsula. A, a, a wonderful, fascinating part of that is that the Western Europe had gone through the Dark Ages. It's not considered politically correct to call it the Dark Ages because there were some good things happening, but they had lost education. 
People were no longer literate in Western Europe. And what happened was when they finally took over the, the uh, Al Andalusia, which some of you, if you've been to southern Spain, if you've been to the Alhambra, all these extraordinary Muslim, Moorish, which is what they call the North African Muslims, Moorish uh, artworks, when they took over that area again and they sort of conquered their libraries, they rediscovered all of this brilliant scholarship that they had lost. They, for instance, had the Western Europe had no access prior to taking over uh, the Iberian Peninsula from the Muslims about the Greek philosophers. All of that had been written down in Arabic by the Muslims. And all of that was re-inherited by Western Europe once they drove the Moors out of the Iberian Peninsula. They uh, adopted the Arabic numerals. You write one, two, three, four, five that we have, those are Arabic numerals. Why are they called that? They actually were invented in India, but the Arabs uh, took them and used them. Um, the concept of zero, which you may never have thought about how important that is. Well, let me, let me put a task to you when you go back to your room. I want you to, do you know Roman numerals? Okay, X11, V, all that stuff. Write down five Roman numerals and add them up. I defy you to do that. Roman numerals cannot be added up because they're not, they don't line up. You can't say I'm gonna, line, I'm gonna add up all the numbers to the right, you know. They had no concept of zero in Roman numerals. Try doing math without zero. Well, they inherited all of that by conquering the Iberian Peninsula and getting the Muslim libraries. It was extraordinary what a boost that was for Western Europe. Then we have the Turkish Muslims under uh, Osman create the Ottoman nation. Later on, they are successful. In 1453, the Ottoman Emperor Mah um, Mahmed II conquers Constantinople, finally breaks through the walls of Constantinople, and in the process, this is in 1453, over the next 100 years or so, this is Constantinople right here. They not only defeat Constantinople, but you remember what Western Europe was afraid of? The Muslim armies moving into Europe? All of this, all of Eastern Europe, all the way up to the gates of Vienna are conquered by the Muslim armies. All of Bulgaria, all of um, Greece, Czechoslovakia, all of the nations in Eastern Europe were Muslim. They were controlled by the Muslim armies. This is the height of the Ottoman Empire, as it later became called, under Suleiman I in the 1580. And so the things that they've been afraid of really happened. The Muslims conquered all of Eastern Europe. At the same time, they had been driven out during this same time period from Western Europe, from the Iberian Peninsula. But still, there was always this pressure. For almost 100 years, they threatened the gates of Vienna. I think the thing we need to realize is that there was a, a very real political, legitimate political motivation for Western Europe to participate in the Crusades. And it's because this is what they feared, and this is what happened. And it continued this way for 500 years. That Western Christian Europe felt threatened by the Muslim armies in the East. Now, I want to spend a few minutes now and talk about the, the military orders of the Crusades, because they're fascinating stuff. Uh, they, and this is what, what I was talking about. Uh, all of this, North Africa, they've been driven out of Spain. This was the Ottoman Empire. And then in the, uh, by the start of the First World War, they've been driven out of most of Eastern Europe, only controlled a uh, tip there around Istanbul and these areas, and all of that was taken back uh, in the First World War and broken up into other, other countries. So the military orders, the one people know most about, the one that was most powerful and richest, was the Knights Templar. Their technical name was the Knights of the Temple of Solomon or the Poor Fellow Soldiers of Christ and of the Temple of Solomon. They officially were founded in 1129. These basically were, were knights who had gone to the Middle East in the Crusades, and they were doing this out of religious devotion. And eventually they began to take pledges, like a monk, of poverty, of chastity, and of obedience. Well, they were monks with swords. Their expression of their, mil of their uh, spiritual dedication and devotion was as soldiers. And they became wealthy because a lot of people, uh, when, when people joined the Order of the Templars, they would give all their property to them because they took a, poverty, a vow of poverty. A lot of people would donate to them because they saw this as an act of devotion as well. And they became the bankers for most of Europe. They became so wealthy that people would come to them and borrow money. In fact, they invented check writing. A knight in Europe, if he had money that he's going to need when he gets to the Middle East, he would give his money to the Knights Templar, and then we, and they would give him a check 
when he got to the Middle East, he could go to the Knights Templar there and show and give them the check, and they would give him his money. So he didn't have to carry all this money all the way that distance and have it taken away from him somewhere. Um, the problem was they were loaning money to most of the, the kings, princes, people all over Western Europe, and that included Philip the, the Fourth of France. They had loaned so much money to Philip the Fourth, he realized he couldn't pay it back. There was no way he was ever going to pay back what he owed them. And so he decided the best thing I can do is get rid of these guys so that I don't have to pay them back. On Friday, October 13th of 1307, Philip IV of France orders the arrest of all of the Templars, especially their leaders. In fact, the tradition is that this is, whether it's true or not, the tradition is that this is why Friday the 13th is considered an unlucky day. It was October 13th of Friday, Friday the 13th. He arrests them. Philip IV, the, the, the King of France and the Pope, had been going back and forth for many, many years about who was, who was really in charge of affairs in Europe. Well, Philip IV threatened to go to war against the Catholic Church if the Pope did not affirm his arrest of these Templars. Well, Pope Clement, at that time, was not a very strong Pope. He gave in to the pressure from Philip IV, and on November 22nd of 1307, he agreed and officially condemned the Templars as being heretics. They were accused of idolatry, of homosexuality, of anything and everything. They tortured them. Some of them confessed to spitting on the cross and various other things they did in secret rituals. All of them later recanted that. They, don't, they only confessed under torture. And then on March 18th of 1314, the leaders of the Templars, including Jacques de Molay, do we have any Masons in the group? You know the, the Masonic Order of de Molay? Is named after him. Jacques de Molay was the, the leader of the, the Templars. He and other Templar leaders are burned alive at the stake in Paris. Before his death, de Molay says, God knows that we are not guilty, and those who are doing this act against us will see consequences. Within a month, the Pope was dead. Before the end of the year, Philip IV of France was dead. And people have often said, it sounds like Jacques de Molay knew what he was saying. So, <laughs> So they're one of the most interesting of, of the various orders. You've, you've seen various manifestations of this. There's even a, a, a narco traficante, you know, drug, drug cartel in Mexico who call themselves the Knight, Knights Templar. There have been so many efforts to try to reclaim the, the name or the glory or the reputation or whatever the Knights Templar, but it's never been successfully done. They were completely disappeared after this. They're actually, they didn't persecute them as much in... Um, in Portugal, and so they continue to have some presence there. This is what they look like, the guys in white, the white tunic, white cape with a red cross. They were the most uh, ferocious warriors in that part of the world, or maybe any part of the world. In fact, 500 Templars and a few thousand foot soldiers defeated Saladin, and Saladin was well known as a general with a great army. Saladin had an army of 26,000 soldiers at the Battle of uh, Montsegard, 500 Templars and a, and a couple thousand other uh, foot soldiers defeated Saladin's army. In fact, Saladin, who was, again, a, a very, a, seemed like a decent guy given the circumstances, he usually, if he captured an army, he would not allow any of them to be killed. He would take prisoners and eventually would release them or whatever, um, except for Knights Templar. If any Knights Templars were captured, they were killed immediately because he thought they were simply too dangerous to leave alive. Um, they were an extraordinary group of people. Um, so, and fascinating to this day. The second group are the Knights of St. John, or the Hospitlers of St. John. They were officially founded a little bit before the Knights Templar, 1113. They, in 1291, they moved from, um, from the Jerusalem area to Cyprus. And if you go there today, you will see presence in Cyprus. They were, in 1309, they moved from Cyprus to Rhodes, and they became known as the Knights of Rhodes. Have any of y'all been to Rhodes? Have you seen the Crusader castles there? Those are Hospitler castles. And then in 1522, they were driven from Rhodes by Suleiman the Magnificent. He's the one that expanded the Ottoman Empire to its greatest extent. And at that time, a force of, um, let me make sure I've got my numbers right here, a force of 500 Knights, uh, Knights of St. John held off all of Suleiman's army of like 22,000 for six months. In fact, at the end, when they were completely running out of supplies and everything, Suleiman gave them the opportunity to 
um, surrender, and he allowed them to march out of their citadel with arms, with flags flying and arms kept to their boats and sail away because he had so much respect for them as soldiers. The Knights Templar, or Hospitlers, I'm sorry, the, the Knights Hospitlers, they had started out caring for poor, sick, and injured pilgrims in the Holy Land. Well, because the pilgrims were being attacked, they eventually developed into a military force to protect those pilgrims who were poor, sick, and injured. And so they went, when they were driven off of Rhodes by Suleiman, they went to Malta. They were given the island of Malta by Charles V of Spain, and they became the Knights of Malta. In fact, this is what they look like. This cross that they wear is still called the Maltese Cross. So if you go to Cyprus, if you go to Rhodes, if you go to Malta, you will find hospitaller castles that they built at various times, and they continued as the Knights of Malta. The third group, I'll mention briefly, the, Teton, uh, Te, the Teutonic Knights. They were German. They were technically called the Order of the Brothers of the German House of St. Mary in Jerusalem. They were founded in Acre at the end of the 12th century. In 1211, again, this is the time when the Crusaders are being driven out, they go to Transylvania and are fighting for the King of Hungary to defend the borders of Hungary. In the 13th century, they participate in what's called the Prussian Crusade to, against non-Christians in that part of the world. And then in 1809, Napoleon Bonaparte outlaws them, but they continue to this day as a charitable organization in Central Europe. And this is what they look like. They had what's called, often called the Latin Cross, which is the Long Cross. Um, and they wore white with a dark cross on it. Um, so, one of the things that they left behind that's fascinating to this day are a series of fortresses, spectacular fortresses. This is Monfort Castle in Upper Galilee in Israel. This is Markab Castle in Syria. The Croc de Chevalier in Syria, which is considered one of the most spectacular castles in the world. In fact, T.E. Lawrence, who was an expert on castles, he, that's why he started traveling in the Middle East, is to view these great monuments. He called Croc de Chevalier perhaps the best preserved and most holy admirable castle in the world. In its heyday, it could hold 2,000 men, soldiers, plus their retainers, plus all their horses. In places, its walls are 100 feet thick. Um, it was part of a defensive chain of castles along, uh, to protect the border of the old crusader states and watching out for Muslim armies gathering in Syria. The Karenia Castle in Cyprus and on and on. There are castles throughout all of the islands of the Mediterranean and throughout the coastal areas. So I mentioned already the reasons for the Crusades. Response to the Byzantine emperor's request for help, defending Eastern Euro or Christian Europe against the further Muslim invasion, hopes to reunite the two halves of Christendom. To, Christendom, by the way, is the reference to the, the lands that were under Christianity, the term Christendom. We don't use it a lot anymore, but that's what it meant. To establish the authority of Pope Urban II as the leader of Christianity, to defend the Christian holy sites and pilgrims, to focus the energies of Western Knights away from internal fighting, to the, the belief in the imminent second return of Christ, and the fact that very few uh, of these knights were looking for adventure or gain. The myths about the Crusades. One, the myth that the Crusades were simply religious prejudice and intolerance that spilled over into violence. Most of the people that participated in the Crusades did so out of an act of devotion. Some of it was misguided, but it was a real act of devotion. Secondly, the myth that the Crusaders did it for money. Most of them bankrupted themselves. They sold everything they had in order to pay for this great this trip. And so they didn't do it for the money. Third, the myth that the plan all along was to conquer the Holy Land and to drive out all the Muslims and Jews. Neither the Pope nor the Emperor in Constantinople had any idea that they were going to conquer the Holy Land. They just wanted to drive to protect Constantinople and Eastern Europe and drive them back. It's like once they got there and they started winning battles, they just kept going. And this was much to the surprise of the Pope and the Emperor. The myth that the Muslims were noble in the face of Christian atrocities or that the Christians were noble in the face of Muslim atrocities. There's no one clear bad guy in this. There were terrible things done by both sides, and there were noble things done by both sides. It's never as clean cut as some of the quotes I read to you earlier. And the myth that all of Christendom was united against Muslim and Jewish people. This was not just, we're going to get those you know, Muslims, we're going to get those Jews, or whatever. It was primarily, foremost, the Crusades were a war of defense. And that's the thing that most people don't get. It turned into a lot of other things later, but that's what the motivation was. This is what we think the Crusaders were like. You know, big and strong and upright and beautiful stallions. This is much more what they probably really were like. <laughs> Many of them never made it home. In fact, the majority of them never made it home. 
and they, many of them knew they weren't going to make it home. Consequences of the Crusades. It did put a halt to the expansion of Islam for a while. And it sort of, it, it did, it ended up the 10th Crusade, the Reconquista drove the Muslim armies out of the Iberian Peninsula. It stopped them for a while, and then they, later on, they did move into Eastern Europe, but then got pushed back again later on. It did cause the final split between Eastern and Western Christianity, and as I say, they're only now, in our lifetimes, beginning to talk again, the leaders of, of Roman Catholicism and Orthodoxy. It reestablished trade between the East and West, including developments in learning and culture. I mentioned that we inherited all of the libraries in the Iberian Peninsula once they were driven out. A lot of these people came back. People in those days did not travel. They didn't, they didn't have a cruise ship. They couldn't get aboard the Star Pride and go visit all these places. And so when they went there in the Crusades, and they, they tasted pomegranates and mangoes, and they saw the different cultures, it developed not only an interest in those things, but an interest in other parts of the world as well. In fact, it's been identified, um, I'll say focus and clarification of the European culture, but the launch of Western spirit of exploration. Once they'd experienced the Middle East and all of its exoticness, its foods, its culture, its color, they wanted to find out what else is going on. And I don't think it's any coincidence that shortly after all of this, 1492, we have the discovery of the New World. At least the European discovery. As I say, there were people here already. They're all saying, well, what do you mean discovery? You know, um, The focus and clarification of European culture, it caused them as a European culture, not just French or German or Italian, but the idea that they had something in common, that they were fighting together, and it gave a sense of European culture. Eventually, I think that would lead down to the whole kind of motivation to have a European Union. I don't think that's too much of a, an exaggeration. The clarification of papal authority, that the Pope was in charge of at least Western Europe, that he was controlling things, though still is the split between the two. But the long term, and then finally, long term enmity between Christianity and Islam. It is a common mistake that the modern problems we have, and I'm going to talk about those this afternoon, the modern problems we have are a result of the Crusades. If you go back and look at the history books, after the Crusades, there is no mention for 500 years of any frustration on the part of Middle Eastern, Arabs, Muslims, anything else, because of the Crusades. They just saw it as a war. Starting around 1900, they started deciding that, okay, we should, we should be upset about that. And then it became a topic of conversation. But between 1400 and 1900, there was virtually no sense in which the Middle East, the Arab peoples, the Muslim peoples, held the Crusades against us. It was war. And people fight wars. There was not this sense of oppression or um, Christianity trying to oppress Islam or, or vice versa. Okay? That's a very new kind of idea that's come along. So these are the Crusades. Any questions about any of that? Why do you laugh when I ask? Yeah. Any, questions? any questions? Any thoughts? Anything? Wow. And there they sat stunned for some moments. That's right. Yes? This might not have anything to do with the Crusades, but when did the name Constantinople to Istanbul change? Well, originally it was Byzantium. When Constantine went there, he didn't call it Constantinople, he called it New Rome, because it was the new capital of the Roman Empire. Other people started calling it Constantinople and it stuck. And then Istanbul, it was changed from Constantinople, which was perceived as a Christian name, to Istanbul after the Ottoman Turks conquered it and took it over and it became their capital. And they renamed it Istanbul, which is very much a more Turkic name. Okay? I don't know the exact date, but that was the, that was the reason for the change. Yes? The Crusades did not have anything, per se, to do with the Spanish Inquisition. In fact, the Spanish Inquisition was not against Muslims. Um, it, was, it was against, primarily, Jewish people who had converted to Christianity, and then they thought they weren't, you know, they weren't Christian enough, and against some Christians that they considered heretics. It was not focused on the Muslims, particularly. Um, and it was, you know, 1400s, I mean, during the, the same people that, that um, Ferdinand and Isabella that funded the trip to the New World, they're the ones that really were responsible for the Inquisition. Um, but it didn't relate to the Crusades per se. Yes? Who funded the Islamic expansion? Where did they get their funding? The Islamic expansion was funded by the governments. Again, that's why everywhere we are now, um, 
these are Muslim countries because it's not just the predominant religion, but the government supports it. I mean, there are many of the brilliant mosques that we see today are funded by government monies. They don't have separation of church and state in the way we understand it. Um, they have written into their constitution acknowledgement of Islam as the predominant faith. Now again, throughout the vast history of Islam, there have been very few periods in which Muslims, at least those uh, with the part of splinter, apart from splinter groups, like ISIL and others, the Muslim peoples have not persecuted Jews and Christians. They have often persecuted pagans, but Jews and Christians are seen as people of the book. That's the expression that they use in the Quran. And for that reason, they have historically been given the right to worship as they wish. They did have to pay an extra tax in order to pay for you know, governing and for the military and everything else. But uh, for the most part throughout the history of Islam, it has been, there's been a connection between the political powers that controlled and the religion. Uh, there were Islamic armies that, can, that conquered all of these areas. Um, and so they don't have this sense of the government not being able to support the faith. Um, in fact, when we were in the United Arab Emirates in Dubai, uh, the government, to make sure that they don't have rogue imams who are preaching inappropriate things, um, and, and that's rare, it does happen, but it's quite rare, the government in the UAE sends out a list every week, the first of the week, is, this is what you're going to preach on on Friday. And they have to speak to that topic. And in Egypt, we ask uh, Abir and Ola about it. While they've not made that, and that's a law in the United Arab Emirates, they have to do that. They're breaking the law if they don't, if they talk on something else. Uh, in Egypt, the government is, is issuing those kind of directions, but not enforcing it as strongly. You know, they're, they're, at this point, it's a very strong encouragement, and they are monitoring it, and you know, they'll call somebody to task if they do it, but it's not actually breaking the law, is my understanding. But again, can you see the government of the United States or Canada or whatever, you know, sending out to, to ministers in their country, priests or pastors, here's what you have to preach on this week? It's a very different world, and, and we make the mistake when we try to take our values and our understanding of the way things ought to work and apply them in other parts of the world. Well, Carolyn and I live in Mexico, as do Jim and Carolyn and others. Well, the, the we're Presbyterians. The United uh, the PCUSA, the Presbyterian Church of the United States of America, has in recent years passed some regulations that are perceived as being very liberal and inappropriate to the National Presbyterian Church of Mexico, which is very conservative. It's predominantly a Catholic country. Well, the National Presbyterian Church of Mexico told the government, these people are a bad influence. So they threw them out of the country. The Presbyterians, PCUSA, the biggest Presbyterian body in the world, was told, you have to leave. You can't be here anymore. And people say, well, they can't do that. Sure they can. It's their country. It's their law. It's their rules. What we think uh, what we're used to or what we think is right, we can't apply those kind of values either in Mexico or in Egypt or anywhere in the Islamic world, for instance. It's a very different kind of relationship that the government and the religion has. Okay? But again, if you hear nothing else that I've said, it has been very, very rare for any official body of Islam, the government or whatever, to oppress, to force conversions, to, to, to do that kind of thing. We focus on Iran, which is one of the reasons why Iran and, and other uh, countries in Islam have strained relationships usually, is because Iran has been very oppressive in many ways. Uh, now we have ISIL and other Sunni, Wahhabis, or, or um, the Salafi groups. But those are the reason they get so much attention is because they're relatively small splinter groups. The vast majority, over 120 religious leaders in the Islamic world has, have completely condemned ISIL. So the idea that all of Islam is like that, or that they approve of that, is simply not not true. It's simply not. You can't say that. But that's a common misunderstanding we have in the West because we want it, we want we want to be mentally lazy and just lump everybody together and say it's always been like that and everybody's like that. And it's, they're just waiting for something to erupt. No, that, those are small, very small layers of, of militant people. Other questions. Thank you all again for your attention. I will see you this afternoon.